Good Sunday morning. Grace and peace to you all. Thank you for joining us, uh, being a part of our virtual class, Geneva class of the Stevens Valley Church. Today, we uh, complete our study of the Gospel of John. It's been over a year that we've been looking at these uh, lessons from week to week, and we come now to the final one in John chapter 21. So again, thank you for your interest. I do hope and pray, as I always do, that you're going to be blessed and your faith increased and your knowledge. That's an objective. That's not the number one objective. Number one objective is that God will receive the glory as we teach his word. So we come to our study for today. And we call it the epilogue, John 21, 1 to 25, the entire chapter. Let's look at the text now. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. But they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But now when you're old, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also or many other things that Jesus did. For every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, commentators have noted, and I think with some accuracy, that this epilogue stands like the bookends with the first chapter. The first chapter dealt with Christ coming into the world to bring light and life. And this chapter, the last chapter, deals with the completion of that work, and now with post-resurrection appearances. And I think even more significant, it gives a view of the church with a gathering of these disciples for breakfast now. It's an assembly. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He was in the midst of them quite physically. But I, I think you see the reflection of the purpose for which Jesus came and now the fulfillment of that purpose at the end of the book. And by the way, it is uh, the place is designated uh, by the Sea of Tiberias uh, here in Galilee. He's come back to Galilee uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, Tiberias, the city of Tiberias, is the only surviving city today along the Sea of Galilee. Question about the authorship of the epilogue. Many scholars believe that John himself did not write it, although it was written under his supervision and, of course, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, we can't be sure, but there are certain things that would tend to point to the fact that it was not John. For instance, we know throughout the gospel, as we have been studying, that John never mentions himself by name, and certainly he doesn't mention his family members. But here we read of his father. And the name of his father, Zebedee. And also, he had earlier described what happened at the Last Supper, uh, the incident when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And Peter said to John or signaled to John to find out who it was. And, and John leaned against Christ and asked. And, and Jesus said, it's the one to whom I give the bread. Well, that had already been discussed at length. Why is this long explanation now repeated? It doesn't sound like John would write it once he had uh, previously written it. And also, the references to we know. John never used this editorial plural, we. And that would suggest uh, a number of people. And then we have a singular pronoun, I, I suppose. John never uses that. And I think even more significantly, chapter 20 seems to have brought John's narrative to a close. Uh, John saying many other things Jesus did in the presence of many witnesses, which are not written in these books, but these are written that you might believe and believing have life in his name. And that just seems to be the end of it. That's the closing, those are the closing words. And yet we have this other chapter. So possibly it wasn't John who wrote it. It doesn't make a great deal of difference, but if we ask the question, who did write it, who did, uh, was responsible for it, it seems that John had moved to Ephesus. Perhaps he was a pastor of the church there. Uh, we know he's an elder, whether he was a preaching pastor or a ruling elder, we don't know. But he's at Ephesus. So Mary is with him. There is a house there known as the House of Mary. And uh, let us suppose that the elders of the church there in Ephesus had heard this account uh, that we find in the 21st chapter, the fishing lesson of Jesus, and perhaps said to John, John, that needs to be, to be written. It needs to be attached to your gospel because it's important. Uh, it, it shows a number of, of significant events, not only the fellowship that they had, but also the restoration of Peter. So very likely that is what happened. Now, there are seven participants not all of the 11 disciples, seven of them. Very interesting. Uh, one of them here at the Sea of Tiberias, uh, one of them, Simon Peter. One of them is Thomas. We saw Thomas featured in the 20th chapter when he was restored. Nathaniel, 
of Cana in Galilee. Nathanael, the same one whom Jesus saw under the fig tree. And that so amazed Nathanael that he said, Rabbi, uh, you are uh, the, the son of God, the king of Israel. And then we have the sons of Zebedee, John and James, and we have two others of the disciples. We don't know who they were. Some have speculated maybe Andrew and Philip because they were specifically mentioned uh, involved in the calling of the disciples in chapter one. So we have these seven. They were together. It's an assembly. It's a fellowship. Thus, it's a meeting of the church. Jesus is there. And uh, he had told them earlier when he was raised from the dead to, to go to Galilee and wait for him there. So they did. And Peter, while waiting, did what he would normally do. He said, I'm going fishing. And the other said, we'll go with you. Now, some have said that there's something really inappropriate in that, that they should not have been fishing, but fishing is what they normally did. And Jesus didn't say when he would be coming. So I, I don't see anything wrong with what Peter and the others did. Besides that, fishing is a symbol for evangelism. Remember that Jesus has said, I will make you fishers of men. So there's a very holy purpose attached to it. Now, what happened while they were fishing? Jesus appeared. They didn't know him at first. They didn't recognize him as Jesus. Just like Jesus had appeared uh, in front of Mary Magdalene. She didn't recognize him at first. She thought he was a, a gardener. Also, notice he sought them rather than they seeking him. And that's always the way it goes. And as we have seen so many times before, he began by asking a question. Children, do you have any fish? And that was a customary and primary means that Jesus used for teaching. So Jesus gave them a fishing lesson. And he said, do you have any fish? That got their attention. And the lesson in it is very obvious. They had been fishing all night. That's the best time to fish. That's when they would most likely catch the most fish. And yet they had caught nothing. Point being, despite their very best efforts, they were a total failure. Reminds us of what Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And Paul is saying that I can do all things in Christ. That's his fishing lesson. By the way, children here could be translated lads. And uh, it, it's interesting that he told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat. There's no significance to the right side of the boat. They were not what they needed to do. They wanted to catch fish. But they didn't know he was Christ at that time. It's interesting. They still did what this person told them to do. And there was a blessing. He said, you'll find some. And they did. 153 fish. But they will recognize him as being Jesus. And the first person to do that was John. As he was the one who recognized when he went in the tomb that the position of the grave cloth could not be in that particular position unless Jesus had been raised from the dead. So he was the first to believe. So even though they didn't know it was Jesus, they obeyed. Their act was not a result of faith in him directly. Calvin made the comment about John, that John recognized him. He was the first to recognize him due to, quote, a holy recognition of divine grace dwelling in his mind. In other words, Calvin says that God gave him a special gift of recognizing truth. And John's remark, according to Calvin, made, was made, made to Peter, caused him to jump in the water with special zeal. Uh, and uh, he was convinced, says Calvin, more, much more by the miraculous catch of fish rather than with his eyes. But that's typical of Peter. And then, of course, the other five are going to recognize Jesus. And uh, John makes a comment, or the writer makes a comment. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. The word for know there is the word Oida, which means simply a visual perception. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Now, John Calvin asked the question, why 
did they, this statement? Why is this statement that none of the disciples dared ask him? And Calvin says, it, I think that they at first were unsure. They recognize him, and yet, is it really? And under normal circumstances, they might have said, Jesus, is it really you? But they were ashamed to do that. Calvin goes on to say, their only reason for being ashamed was that they were not certain enough that he was the Christ. For we are accustomed to ask about what is doubtful and obscure. The evangelist, therefore, means that the disciples did not question Christ because they were afraid of wronging him. So plainly did he reveal himself by obvious signs. So they had their breakfast fellowship. Come and have breakfast. This was the third appearance to them. Uh, again, you can see how this last chapter supplements, complements the first chapter, because in the first chapter, uh, you will see, for instance, Jesus saying to Nathaniel, come and see. Or, and Philip saying, to, come and see. Uh, so that come and see invitation is replicated here. Come and have breakfast. Come and see. Come and, and we'll have fellowship together. Eating together is always among followers of Christ. It's a, an expression of the fellowship that we share together. So we have seven disciples, but the narrative is focusing on Peter and John. The uh, detail that is added here about Peter grabbing his cloak uh, quickly is probably emphasizing more his haste in running to Jesus than in, in the fact that he's getting his clothes. What they find, I think what is emphasized here is the fire and the fish. And there's symbolic meaning in that that goes along with this um, fishing lesson, as it were. Because the, the fish that they eat are not theirs. They, Jesus said, bring some fish, but he had already had fish there. Um, I don't know if it was a grill. He is cooking them over a coal fire. So, and, and where did Jesus get the fish? We would infer that they came miraculously. Also, interesting, when Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, he gave a blessing. There's no reference to a blessing here. One commentator said, the reason is Christ being there after the resurrection is a sufficient blessing. Let's go to the symbolism now of the fish and then of the coals. As I said a moment ago, fish represents evangelism. You're going to be fishers of men. Disciples are going to do that. That's their commission. And, and when Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you, we studied that last week, Jesus is going to send them to be fishers of men, to preach the gospel, and, and to save men through evangelism. Now, when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? I think he's talking not about the fish, but about the other disciples. We'll come to that in just a moment. But this is in line with the commission we looked at last week. Uh, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Just the fact of the fish being there. And, and this is now repeated. It's interesting in the presence of Thomas. Now look at these lists of the seven disciples the five whom we know, uh, Peter, James, and John, were part of that inner circle. And, of course, uh, we're going to have Nathaniel added. Uh, and I mentioned the special significance that might be attached to him because of what happened under the fig tree. And then Thomas is there because of, no doubt, his experience, of, and we looked at this last week, of going from the depths of unbelief to the height of belief. So they all have a, a particular significance, it would seem, in being there. But again, the main lesson that Jesus is teaching here through the fish is that human wisdom and effort is nothing. The net was filled at the Lord's word, not as a result of their efforts. And they are to be fed by bread and fish provided by the Lord, not by their own catch. Now, for Peter... The fish would indicate his first example of reinstatement as a fisher of men. And uh, here you see the symbol often used by early Christians, the fish. Uh, it is said that uh, during the time of persecution, when you did not want to 
perhaps uh, reveal your identity lest you be uh, thrown to the lions or something like that. The Christians would oftentimes draw a half of the fish, the, the semicircle in, in the dirt. And then if the other person it was a Christian to identify that he was, he would complete it and draw the other uh, curve in, in the dirt and it would make the, the shape of a fish. And there's a second symbolism. The word for fish in Greek is ixus, uh, with five letters in Greek. And each of those letters, the first letter in those five letters, uh, would stand for, as you see above, Jesus, or Jesus, Christos, Christ, Theos, God, Weos, Son, Soter, Savior. Now, what about the symbolism of the coals? Well, recall that Peter's first denial of those three denials was at a fire of coals in front of the, the temple. And so it is appropriate that now he's going to be reinstated uh, with in front of a fire of coals. That first denial at the fire was the time that he forfeited his apostleship. Now, how do we know that? Well, Mark 16 and verse 7 in this resurrection announcement recorded by Mark, Jesus says, go tell his disciples and Peter, which is strange. He didn't just say, go tell the disciples, tell the disciples and Peter, which would suggest that at that point, Peter was not named and numbered among the disciples. Now he is being absolved from that sin and being restored to his position as an apostle, indicated by Jesus saying, so I send you, or it could be translated, so I too send you, speaking to Peter. So in this session that Peter has with the Lord, uh, this dialogue, Jesus is going to eradicate from him any trace of the former self-confidence that Peter had. And he is going to preclude any judgment by his public reinstatement. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look at what Calvin is going to say. That the restoration to soundness was necessary, not only for Peter, but for his hearers. Calvin says it's necessary for Peter so that he could more energetically prosecute his office. Had he not been formally and officially restored to the position of apostle, it would always have uh, uh, inhibited his uh, ability and confidence in preaching the gospel. On the other hand, to his hearers, so that the stain attached to him would not make them despise the gospel. Uh, people would be saying, perhaps, you know, Peter denied the Lord. Why should we believe what he says? Well, now we know that he has been publicly reinstated. But let's see now how that occurs. It occurs with three questions that the Lord asked Peter after breakfast. And I guess they're sitting around this coal fire and Jesus is talking to them. And then he turns to Peter and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I mentioned a moment ago that I think that the these here refers not to the fish, but to the other disciples. I had a teacher who insisted that it referred to the fish. And what Jesus was saying is, since Peter was out fishing, Peter, do you love me more than you love these fish? Well, the reason I would not think that was correct was the fact, again, that these fish represent saved people. They represent the elect of God. They represent the people who hear the gospel and accept it. So I don't think that uh, Jesus would be using it in a negative sense. But remember what Peter had done, what Peter had said earlier. And Jesus talked about the fact that he would be betrayed. The Son of Man will be betrayed uh, into the hands of sinners. He will be crucified and he will rise from the dead. And, and remember Peter said, Lord, I will never deny you. I will never deny you, even though everyone else does. Well, he had boasted about the fact that he was uh, had a stronger faith than the other disciples. He put himself above the others. Well, and Jesus is going to make him face that problem and come to terms with it. And, and, and also, 
Notice Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He doesn't use the title Peter. Jesus had given him this title of Peter, this name of Peter, which in the Aramaic is Cephas. Now, Simon comes from a word that means a pebble. Well, you know, a pebble can be easily dislodged. You can kick it with your feet as you're walking along. It doesn't have any stability to it. It's not big enough. But the word Peter or the word Cephas means a boulder or perhaps even uh, an outcropping of cliff. Uh, so something that could not be moved easily. So what Jesus seems to be saying here is Simon, son of John, you remember when you said that you would never deny me, though everyone else did? Now, tell me, do you really love me more than these others, more than John, more than James, more than Nathaniel, more than Thomas? And he's got to think about his boasting. But as we look at it, Jesus is going to ask him, do you love me using the Greek word agapao? That's the love, that's the high love of intelligence, reason, comprehension, and purpose. But Peter did not answer him with that word. Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he used the word phileo, and that means affection or liking. Peter, do you love me with a love that, that represents an understanding of who I am, the comprehension, the purpose, the reason? No, Lord, you know that I like you. Well, Jesus let it go. And he just commanded him at that point. Feed my lambs. The word for feed there is bosque. And the word for lambs would be arnia. Bosque ta arnia mu. Feed my lambs. Well, what does he mean by lambs? Well, it might be that he's talking about Christians who are babes in the faith. We need to feed on the milk of the word. Recently converted Christians. Immature Christians. Uh, they need to... Uh, to be nourished with the more basic principles. That's possible. There's another possibility though. Feed my lambs, these are young sheep, could refer to young people or children. And why would we say that? Well, Jesus said when people, his disciples tried to prevent children from coming to him to be blessed, he said, let the little children come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. The fact that the kingdom of heaven belongs to children, and that thus children are in the kingdom uh, was what convinced Martin Bucer when he was uh, being uh, challenged by the Anabaptists who didn't believe in the baptism of infants. This is the reason we baptize infants. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, either of those are possibilities for the lambs, but I've rather believe it was a reference to the children in keeping with Jesus' emphasis on their importance. Now, the second question. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, this time he doesn't say, do you love me more than these, meaning probably the other disciples. You claim that you would really love me more than these because you would never deny me if the other, even the others did. So this time that's not, that's taken care of. So he says, do you love me? And Jesus again uses the word agapao. Do you have this, this higher love for me? And Peter never dares to say that he has this higher love. He now is humbled uh, by all of these events, humbled by his own denial of them. So he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I like you, Phileo, I love you in that sense. I have this affection for you, you know that. And again, Jesus lets it go. And he gives him a second command, but it's different this time. It's not feed my lambs, it's tend my sheep. Now the word for tend that you see here is poimane, and it's the word from which we translate pastor. Pastor my sheep. Sheep in this sense, probata, could be either lambs or adult sheep. The point is tend them. Tend them is a broader command. 
of course, give them food, nourishment, both milk and meat of the word, but look after them, protect them, guide them. All this involved in pastoral work is encompassed in this command, tend my sheep. And it's a progressive bee tending, bee feeding. Now, there's no further reference to this more than these comparison. This is the question that says, Peter, do you really love me? Peter can't say, I really love you with the higher level of love, but he can say, I do like you. I do have affection for you. Now we have the third question, which again is different. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But what Jesus used here is phileo. He came down to Peter's level. He said, Simon, son of John, do you like me? Do you have affection for me? He changed the verb to the one Peter was using. He accommodated himself like he accommodated uh, uh, Thomas's demands that he meet him with uh, his uh, touching his wounds. And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. He appealed to his omniscience. You know everything. You, you know that I like you. I've said it twice before. You know it. And in Greek, it is the word su, genoskes, pote, philo, say. Genoskes is that powerful word, strong word for no. You know it. And this time Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. But he used a different word for sheep. He used the diminutive word for sheep. Feed my dear sheep. Fear, feed my precious sheep. So three times, for the three times that Peter denied Jesus. And I think the significance of all of this done publicly in presence of the other six disciples who are there is to show he's made the transition now. Jesus had given him the name of Cephas or Peter, Rock. He didn't live up to that. He denied Jesus three times and resorted to the idea of Simon, a small pebble. But he's made the transition now to a rock, and he shows it in his leadership, in, in his work as an apostle. Linsky comments on this fact that Peter is so deeply grieved. He said, what went to Peter's heart was this verb, feeling, phileo, in the final question. Hast thou affection for me? Do you like me? When Jesus twice asked about the higher love, once as to its degree compared with others, and then about its very presence, Peter, with all due humility, ventured to assert only the lower form of love. But now in this third question, Jesus probed even for this lower love of which Peter felt so sure that for its presence in his heart, he could appeal to the omniscience of Jesus. This grieved him so deeply. Now we come to the sixth and seventh of the seven last words of Jesus after his resurrection. Feed my sheep, follow me. And Jesus tells Peter what is going to happen to him. He's going to live to an old age, but then he's going to be under the control of others. Uh, they will dress him, uh, bind him, lead him about. And of course, that's a reference to uh, persecution, imprisonment, and death. But now, the point is, he must follow Christ. If you look at the time Jesus being crucified, somewhere around 30, and Peter being put to death in the 60s. So Peter has a 30-year a, a ministry ahead of him, and he'll be an older man. Matthew Henry said that it is not only appointed to all once to die, but it is appointed to each what death he shall die, whether natural or violent, slow or sudden, easy or painful, that is the great concern of every man, whether death he die, whatever death he dies, to glorify God in it. Now, Eusebius reported that Peter was crucified upside down at Rome in AD 64 under Nero. Uh, that's very likely is true. That a rope was tied around his waist as he was led to the cross. That is possible. Um, Peter would have been uh, well known in Rome at that time. His faith had faltered. 
but had not failed as Jesus had prayed. He told him he was going to deny him three times. He said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith not fail. And when you are converted or restored, strengthen your brothers. Now is the work. It begins the work of strengthening his brothers, which Peter carried on admirably. Now, we might note Peter is restored, but he is not given the position of prominence over the others. There's a sense in which he was a leader of the apostles. He's very outspoken, very uh, impetuous, very much a, a, of a leader. But no idea here that he is going to uh, be head of the church in every respect. But now Peter and John seem to be the two who are emphasized at this fishing lesson. And as we see, Peter asked Jesus, what's going to happen to John? After Jesus explains to Peter what's going to happen to him, he said, what about this man? Now, some people think, I confess I used to think, that that was a rather uh, rude question. Uh, maybe he is being uh, jealous in some sense, uh, maybe just plain nosy. I don't think so. Because if you look at the whole account of Peter and John, of course, James is a part of that inner circle. I think you see these people very close to each other. Uh, Peter and John were friends from way back. They were the closest of friends. So I don't think there's anything negative in Peter saying to Jesus, what about this man? Jesus had told Peter of his ministry and of his martyrdom. And, and of course, there are differences between Peter and John. Peter's very impetuous, as you know. John's very cautious. Peter's a talker. John's a thinker. Peter is older. John is younger. And the differences between these two leaders of the church, these two apostles, may be indicative, symbolic, of the personal nature of the effectual calling of all of us. We are different. And we are called in our different circumstances, which Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians 12. And that means differences in service in the body, in the church, which makes up the completeness of the church. Well, let's see the scene now. At first, Jesus and the seven disciples are sitting around this fire of coals. They're having breakfast there on the Sea of Galilee. And at some point, Jesus must have got up and started walking with Peter. He may have motioned to Peter to come with him. Now, in this sense, Peter is indeed quite literally following Jesus. And uh, that's the time Jesus is going to tell him about his coming martyrdom, his, his ministry before that. And then we see that John also followed. Did Jesus motion for John to come or did Peter motion for John to come? We don't know. Or did John just notice that Peter and the Lord got up and he wanted to follow Jesus and be close to him? And so he just followed along. And I think it's indicative of the close friendship and affection that John had for both Jesus and Peter. And then Peter seemed to have looked around and he saw his dearest friend following and asked about him. Well, what about this man? Jesus said, well, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And again, I think his question emanated from Peter's love for John. And what Jesus was telling him was, don't worry, Peter. God will take care of it. We have plans for John. And, and your job is to follow me. And this is a closing comment. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Some have speculated that this 21st chapter was written sometime after John's death. Well, that can't be true. Because the statement is, this is the disciple, not this was the disciple. This is the disciple. So obviously John is still living 
And we would assume that he is supervising this writing if he didn't write it himself. So uh, that would, would say John was still living, and yet he thinks these things are important enough to be set down. So this John, John is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and who's written these things. And we, who are the we, plural, we would refer perhaps to the elders at Ephesus. We know that his testimony is true. We confirm it. So this is a matter of, notice the second point, confirming to the church at a later time. This is a generation later, people living now at the end of the first century who did not live at the time of Christ. And it's possible that John is the only one of the apostles still left living. So this is confirming to this church of a later generation the reliability of John's witness and, of course, the reliability of all the writers of Scripture. So the disciple refers to John. We, probably to the presbytery, the eldership at, at Ephesus. I, probably to the scribe. Only one person could write. So that is probably the, the actual writer. And this statement, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books, is, of course, a hyperbole. But it expresses the writer's feelings of all the things that Jesus did. But again, these things are the essential things for the production of belief. So why would these Ephesian elders want this account recorded? And by this time, the church was 60 years or so removed from the time of the resurrection. But this incident is depicting church life at a time where churches have been established at many places uh, in Asia and uh, in Europe. And so it's a depiction of church life that relates to their experience 60 years later and to our experience. And I'm going to suggest that there are six reasons reasons here. First, the presence of Christ in the fellowship with believers. And if you say, well, Christ is no longer present with us. No, he is. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And of course, very much present in the Lord's Supper, as he was present in this breakfast fellowship meal. He's present with us in our fellowship meal at communion. Secondly, it, it would emphasize the credibility and the authority of the apostles to them and to us. Third, it would em emphasize the importance of feeding and nourishing the flock with the word of God. Peter's responsibility, the responsibility of all of the apostles, they have discharged that and their word is authoritative. It was for the church in the time of John, 60 years later, it is true today. And then the fact, obviously the lesson from the fishing, the fact that what we do on our own really counts for nothing. And the fact that Christ provides and enables everything. And finally, I think we see in this, the fact, and we see it with Thomas as well, Christ's work will not be thwarted by sin. Not by Thomas's unbelief, which was restored to faith, and not by Peter's denial, he had forgiveness and restitution. Linsky's observation. The presbyters heard from John of these events and saw the great value of including these accounts, uh, these events in John's account. John consented to the, their just desire and allowed them to write the supplement. They reproduced his own narration in a way that he approved, including the final word of attestation and conclusion. And Linsky concludes by saying, the Ephesian presbyters have earned the gratitude of the church of all ages for having John close his gospel with a chapter that is so precious to us all. We come to the end of our study of the gospel of John. Next week, Lord willing, I'd like for us to look at another book John wrote, which uh, is very close to this gospel but the, uh, the emphasis, whereas the gospel is on the production of belief, the emphasis in First John is on the assurance of our salvation. So hope you continue to uh, uh, join our class week after week as God gives us the opportunity. Thank you for your uh, attendance and for your interest throughout this class. And I do pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you 
that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.